tell us about some of the images you brought in, and what's this? This is some out of control stuff. This is the um, X-51 uh, hypersonic test uh, missile. It's a NASA X-plane. Um, and they can't really get it to fly properly. <laughs> um, it flies like six times the speed of sound. And the whole thing is a beautiful um, ceramic um, you know, wedge um, that always keeps disintegrating over the Pacific. Um, but it's very exciting because it's a, the whole world of flight hasn't really changed. You know, when, when we all get on our planes um, tonight or tomorrow, we're going to be in kind of 1960s, 1970s ideas of, of aircraft. Um, and this is the new stuff, and it's much faster, and it's there. Now, what they need to figure out is how to keep it up in the air. But um, I think they're, they're doing three minutes now, which is pretty good. So how does this manage to attain such speeds that are so like, far removed from the speeds we can travel at today? It's, co it's computing. It's, like it's, it's an uncontrollable object, and only computer code can keep it stable. And I think that's quite interesting that there's like physical objects out there, including every Airbus aircraft. It, could, it wouldn't fly anymore when you switch off the computer systems. It would just like fall down. So the, the software becomes an integral part of a physical object. Um, and I think that's a, that's a fact and that's a reality. Um, and that's not even the future, that's now. Because most commercial airliners are flown by a computer these days, aren't they? But I imagine that most of them, if the computers shut down, could the, could the captain, the pilot, still land the plane? Or is, is the man, he's just there as a figurehead it depends. of humanity? There's two, there's, two bit, there's two schools. There's the, the Boeing school is very solid. So you can switch off everything, and you can literally fly a 747 like a Cessna. Um, the European way of doing it, the Airbus way, is the complete opposite the plane isn't stable in the air without the computer systems. So, so the computer actually, the, the pilot thinks he's flying it, but actually the computer con continuously intervenes and keep, keeps the aircraft stable. So they don't even really need a pilot then? Probably not, probably not. And that's, you know, remotely aircrafted, uh, remotely piloted aircraft are very, I mean, they're, they're changing the face of war and also politics. Um, Drones. So it's, it's also, that is a reality, and we will probably have them um, very soon in you know, commercial airliners. And, and so beyond commercial aircraft, how will this thinking affect other objects? Like, for example, you do a lot of work with car brands, and Google released a couple of years ago the driverless car. Are car brands looking to the day when a driver won't be needed to, to concentrate on the road, can, can relax, can read the newspaper, surf the internet? Is that, is that far away? Well, it, it's there. The, those cars are driving very successfully, um, you know, in California, in Bavaria, in every, every, you know, every car company has autonomous vehicles. But um, the interesting thing is that now legislation and politics need to catch up because what happens if? Uh, there's so many questions around that. So the, the big challenge is not building the self-driving vehicle anymore. The big challenge is to build the system around it. This is something we're very excited about. We, we are at the moment working with the engineers building these um, race cars. It's a Le Mans, it's an Audi Le Mans uh, R18 race car. And these cars represent the ultimate in losing fat, in getting rid of unnecessary weight, and basically shaping objects that combine a lot of technologies. Um, new technologies in a car that's just to build to, to last 24 hours on a racetrack in Le Mans. And working with these guys is really exciting because the way they um, see a vehicle, it's a system. They only think about it as a very complex system. Um, the way they think about sustainability, they think about sustainability as a system from, from cradle to grave, from like getting metals out of the ground, you know, melting them, processing them, and so, so it's, you know, it's the same with carbon fiber. They, they really consider saving weight in a vehicle, like how much fuel can you save on the road by saving weight, but how much energy do you have to invest in the lightweight materials in order to do that? And they run the numbers on all of that. And that's very exciting because it's, it's a whole new, it's not the wood thing. It's almost ridiculous to, you know, it's not, now we do like, organic sustainable furniture and we get out the chainsaw and 
Um, and those guys, they think completely differently. They really think of energy as you invest energy in an object, make it very light, but then you need the return on investment by saving energy afterwards. And only if that, only if you break even and actually, you know, save energy after 100,000 kilometers on the road, only then it's worthwhile doing it, otherwise it's a waste. So it's not a moral argument, it's more like a spreadsheet argument. It's an enormous spreadsheet, you know, because a car has 50,000 components, so you actually run the numbers on the whole thing. And, and there's no, and it's uh, very difficult to explain that to, 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 to non-engineers, because it's like the whole idea is like, you have to know how, t how metals are melted down, how, mine, how much energy mining uh, requires and so on. Um, so it's very, it's, it, it's not very good for marketing. Like the wood thing is much easier, like getting the chainsaw out. It's like everybody agrees that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an organic and uh, natural thing, a wooden chair. But um, actually a plastic chair might be much more efficient. It m may last much longer and the energy invest m may be much lower. No, it's a fascinating argument. And uh, when people think about sustainability and saving the planet, they automatically think about uh, having a, a natural wooden table and eating a, a fish from the ocean, but you're then taking a tree and a fish out of the ecosystem to do that. Exactly, and you know, and design students kind of these days tend to think that everything they can make with a cordless drill is amazing, and that's also rather naive. You know, like the the age of mass production hasn't stopped with more and more people on this planet, so we can't customize products for everybody. This is. Istanbul, I think. This is Istanbul. Um, and we're really excited about Istanbul. Um, the Istanbul Biennale is kicking off on um, October 10. And we're, doing, we're participating in the show. Um, Joseph Grimmer, the chief editor of Domus, is curating. It's one of the two big uh, shows at Biennale. It's called Autocracy. And it's dedicated to all systems that operate outside of the established systems um, and we're showing the uh, multi-thread uh, furniture we've designed for Nilofar um, in an old school in Istanbul, and we're really excited about that. And um, basically what we're doing with the multi-thread furniture that we actually start, we don't do, we don't do the much hype 3D printing of plastics, which is an old thing. You know, it's like Ron Arad has done that like 15 years ago. He started doing stereolithography. So 3D printing models is nothing new at all. Um, but now there's technologies where you can actually print usable objects. So with, uh, you know, with printing plastics, you can't even really make an ashtray because it's going to melt. So most people do egg cups. Egg cups are very popular in 3D <laughs> printing. Um, but now there's technologies where you can actually melt down metal straight away and print metal objects straight away. And that's what we're using. It's called selective um, laser melting. You can use any metal. You, you basically have a laser that, you know, melts down little portions of powder and you build up an object. And that's what we're using for our um, furniture. And the interesting thing is that we, com we, we don't need anybody to do this anymore. We, we have a network of companies that provide us with you know, the printouts, the tubes, the color, blah, blah. And we write the software that ties all of that together and just produce it ourselves. So we basically deliver to our gallerist an entire show you know, the whole thing, including the furniture, the boxes, the crates, the, you know, everything. Um, and, and Joseph ha kind of has identified a couple of similar um, mode, modes of operation, people making drones, people plugging stuff together. Um, and in many cases, stuff, intellectual property of third parties. So it's, it's no longer that the inventions of the 21st century are no longer the jet engine, the, the, the Edison light bulb, this kind of, you know, singular iconic object. Singular bright moments. Um, but a lot of them are collaborative efforts. By definition, like every, you know, every computer, every camera, every mobile phone, every one of you has one or two devices in their pockets that are built from the intellectual property of thousands of people. You know, lines of code, patents for this, patents for that. Um, and that's actually what I wanted to talk about uh, during the next slide, so we can um, do that. I love these. Uh, I love these. Um, I love this image. It's it's like one of the best images ever. It's almost pornographic in the sense that it shows us 
how incredibly complex every human being, every animal is. Uh, and there's so much chem chemistry, engineering, bioengineering going on that nobody really understands it. No, not even doctors really understand it. Not even biologists really understand it. There's always an expert who knows about your teeth, who knows about you, yeah, um, very particular fields. But the big challenge of the 21st century is to control entire systems, complex systems, and understand all of it. This is some finite elements analysis, and we're, this is something we're bringing into the design software we're writing. So we, we basically take, we take engineering um, code that lets us calculate the forces acting within an object under load. And we're bringing that into design software we're writing um, in the very beginning. So as we design something, we can see what happens inside the object. Um, and that's a quite new thing to do, because normally, this kind of software comes in after the designers have long left the room. You know, then the engineers figure out how to do it, and they use a standalone piece of software to take a 3D model, they load it into that software, they look at it, and they understand how it, how it works. Um, we want that instantly, and we want to use it to see things that the eye can't see. Um, and that's big fun, uh, because in many cases, you, you, you make assumptions you think that you know, there's a lot of strain on the joint there, but it's not. It's somewhere else. You know, and it and you're you're talking about using this for 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 spaceships or for tables and chairs and for, and everyday for, objects. For space for spaceships, it's being used anyways. Yeah? And we're using it for tables and chairs now because think, we think that tables and chairs really deserve this kind of attention. <laughs> um. So that's the new sustainability, like chairs that don't involve cutting down trees anymore. Exactly. Clemens, thank you so much. It's been fascinating. Thank, Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you for coming.